Welcome to worship. It's good to be together. Be good to be with you today. If you are taking part on Facebook, we please ask you to say hello to your fellow worshipers today, make a comment, and greet each other online. Today we continue our gradual return to in-person worship. Today is the first Sunday with a maximum of 50 in attendance for each worship service. You can make sure you pay attention to Thursday e-news that comes out every week. You can see there for information on taking part as part of the in-person worship services as we return to gathering gradually. Remember that Lisa needs to hear from you by 5 p.m. on Wednesday in order to accommodate your spots. Council meets again on May 10th, and when they meet, they will once again take up the conversation about further steps in regathering. We will celebrate Holy Communion today as we gather. Those who are present in the room are uh, have their communion to share at their seat, and I encourage you who are worshiping online to get some bread and wine or grape juice together now so that you can participate at the time of the meal in the worship service. Pastor Emily's new Bible study on the letters of Paul is in its early stages, and you are always welcome to hop in whenever you can. The Bible study meets outside here on campus on Thursday mornings, weather permitting, and by Zoom on Thursday evenings. See the e-news for the details on that. And also, mark your calendars now for Sunday, May 23rd. That's three weeks from today. We will take part in our next drive-through communion experience and event. And then we, we hope to have some other activities as well that day. So keep an eye on the e-news. We'll have more details this Thursday. Once again, it's great to gather with you here in person as well as uh, in your online spaces as well. Join with me as we begin with our Easter greeting. Christ is risen. Christ is, risen Christ is alive. Christ is Let us sing. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Let us pray. O oh, gracious teacher, you sent your son Jesus to show us that you are the life-giving vine for all that exists. Nourish our life in his resurrection promise that we may bear the fruit of love and know the fullness of your joy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. It's time for our children's message, that time when we gather more closely with the younger ones in our midst. And let me encourage you to get close to the screens at home and spend some time with us here now. We've started the process of people coming back together. Can't wait until we're able to expand those numbers and have more of you back here. You know that Pastor Emily and I like to ask questions. So today's question for you is this. What does following Jesus have to do with growing grapes? What does following Jesus have to do with growing grapes? That sounds like the start of a really bad joke, doesn't it? But in our Bible reading today, Jesus paints a word picture for us using the idea of grapes growing on a vine. Jesus says to his followers, I am the grapevine and you are my branches. You are here to grow something, not grapes, but love. Then in order to do that, he uses a word we don't hear very much. He tells us to abide, A-B-I-D-E, abide. Do you know what that means? What is abiding really about? Well, sometimes we refer to our house as our abode, and it comes from the same word, abode. It's where we live. Jesus is talking about where we live. Some of us abide in a house. Most of us probably do. Some of us abide in an apartment or a condo. Some of us are in a townhouse. Some of us may even abide in a hotel. There are lots of places we can abide where we live. Jesus says something very different, however. He doesn't talk about a building. He doesn't talk about a house. Jesus says in order to be his followers and to share his work, that we need to abide in his love. We are to make his love our home. So how do we do that? That's what I'd like you to talk with your parents about and your families this week. What are some ways you abide in God's love? How do you make love like the house you live in every day? Now, we could probably think of some ways. If we were here together, we would name some things together, like uh, reading Bible stories. That's a way to abide in God's love, like we're doing today. Also, praying. And both of those things are a part of worship like singing as well, and hearing inspirational music. Maybe finding someone you can help, like being a friend to a lonely person, or helping feed people who are hungry, or just helping your parents or your siblings around the house. Certainly when we come together for worship, whether it's here in this room or together online, then we are working on abiding in God's love. All of these things are important ways. And I imagine you could think of others, but, and maybe one day this fall, hopefully soon, but we just don't know yet, but one day soon, we will be able to gather together again for faith formation, for instance, between our worship services, and be in the groups and see each other face to face. And some of our groups are doing that outside now. Jesus says the way to help him share God's love is to find ways to abide, to live in his love. Talk about that with your families this week and see how many ways you can figure out to do that. Let's pray. Good and gracious God. Jesus said that we don't just need to live in a house or have a place, a shelter to call home, but we also want to try our best to live in your love. 
Teach us, O oh God, how to know what that means and to build love for everyone to live in. May we abide in your love now and always. Amen. Thank you for <clears throat> being with me for this special time and look forward to the time we are able to be face to face again. Thanks. A reading from the fourth chapter of Acts. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, get up and go towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the Lord's spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to slaughter and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom may I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with the scripture, he, pro he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What if to prevent me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And the eunuch replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down to the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and he was passing through the region. He proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Here ends the reading. fourth chapter of first john beloved let us love one another because love is from god everyone who loves is born of god and knows god whoever does not love does not know god for god is love god's love was revealed among us in this way god sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him in this love not that we loved god but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins Beloved, since God loved us so much, 
we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. Here ends the reading. according to John, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. I am the vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been pruned by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, Ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. The word of God for the people of God. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Well, we've been reading from the Gospel of John since Easter. As part of this Gospel, John's Jesus, as opposed to or at least different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke's Jesus, Mark's Jesus, of John's Jesus rather, gives these picture words of Jesus describing himself with five different I am statements. Jesus says to his followers, I am the bread of life. I am light of the world. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the good shepherd of the sheep, which we read last week. And today Jesus tells his followers, I am the vine. You are the branches. God is is divine grower. He uses this parable or metaphor of grapevines to talk about a relationship of God and Jesus and us all together and connected. He is the vine, we are the branches, God tending the vines as the vine grower. Now one of the first things that Jesus makes clear that we often lose sight of and I think often forget is 
he talks about life and God pruning us, that pruning is necessary and must be done. Pruning helps vines produce more fruit. And the fruit Jesus talks about us producing is, of course, love. But notice, and this is so important, who does the pruning? It is God. In other words, as branches of the vine, we don't do any pruning of others ourselves. What we can do is pay attention to the pruning that needs to happen with us and within us. What does God need to prune in our lives? But we're not asked, mind you, to think about how others need to be pruned. Apparently that's not in our skill set. You and I know that we would love to take some shears to some of the other branches on this Jesus vine from time to time, right? But God knows better and has not entrusted that pruning to us. In fact, Jesus, as the vine, doesn't even get to do any pruning. So if Jesus doesn't get to prune and only find ways as the vine to nourish the branches so they can grow and produce more fruit, then we know pruning the other branches on our vine is nothing we have to worry about either. It's important to bear that in mind. So according to John's Jesus, what's a branch to do? What is a branch to do? What can we do in order to produce more fruit, more love? And here comes that word which I addressed in the children's message, abide. We are to pay attention to and be intentional about abiding. The most important thing branches do to produce the most and the best fruit that the vine can help us produce and that the vine grower wants and needs is to abide in Christ, more specifically to abide in his love. Now, from time to time, I have mentioned to many of you the dog that Cindy and I have in our home. Her name is Tessa. She's a Yorkshire Terrier. She's between 9 and 10 years old, and we've had her now for almost four years. Tessa is a rescue, and she was let go, abandoned, given up by a family or a household before ours. So every time we get ready to leave the house... What happens? Tessa begins to visibly shake. You can see her shaking, quaking in her boots, you might say, if she wore boots. But she's like freezing cold shivering, and it's nothing but the anxiety over our departure. She definitely has separation anxiety and would prefer that we never leave the house at all. No matter how many times we leave and come back, she still shakes and cries every time we get ready to leave the house. And of course, when we finally come home, whether it's been 10 hours or just 10 minutes, the reaction is the same. Oh my gosh, you're home. And she's jumping up and down and she's dancing in her dance and spinning in circles on her hind feet. And she's trying to lick us as if we are lollipops for dogs. And the reason I'm telling you about Tessa is she loves to abide. She understands what abiding really means. No matter where we are in the house, she has to be in that room. But she does not like it when I'm in one room and Cindy is in another. And what she does is go back and forth the whole time and stays in the middle and where she can hear us both and goes and checks on us both all the time. She will follow us anywhere we go in the house, especially if there's only one of us in there at the, at the house at the time. And when we finally do sit down on the couch, what does she do? Jumps up on the couch and plops down right next to us. Now, her preference is to sit in our lap, of course. And sometimes we allow that and other times we don't. But if she's not sitting in our lap, what is she doing? She's there right next to us, nuzzling up against us, making sure that there's contact between Tessa and us. And at night, she loves to sleep with us in our bed too. She wants to be in contact with us then as well. She won't settle until she nudges up against one of us and then she can go to sleep. 
Well, when Jesus talks about abiding in his love, he's talking about remaining close, staying connected, live in a constant awareness of God's love or Jesus' love to maintain some kind of contact as if our life depended on it. Tessa is an excellent reminder of that for me at my house. Uh, that that kind of abiding helps us produce more love, if you will. And I can think about that in the context of abiding in Christ or in the love of God as a way that will help me be more loving on my better days, to abide in God's love on a regular basis. So how do we do that? I imagine we will all have different answers to that question. How do we abide in God's love? I mentioned some of them in the children's message, didn't I? And certainly worship is a way that we abide. Worship is a way we remember who we are and how much we are loved and how we exist in this state of love. Prayer and meditation is important. Reading and study of the Bible is important. Conversations with other people of faith are essential to abiding. Listening to inspirational music is another way we abide. Spending time in God's natural world, especially this time when literally the world is springing back to life. It's another way we see God loving us through the beautiful creation, the natural world. Spending time with people who care about us and whom we care about. And sometimes that might also be spending time with our pet friends like Tessa who can help us understand what abiding is all about. Basically, anything that helps us remember that we are loved and that grace is the energy that fuels our lives and the core of who we are to be. I remember reading a suggestion by author and Franciscan priest Richard Rohr, who I've quoted many times. I've read several of his books. It's been several years, but he talked about some simple practices that we can engage in to continually abide. Starting the day and ending the day are essential. As we get up in the morning, whether it's before we get out of bed or while we're getting ready or getting our shower or when we're heading out the door, to, to pray some simple prayers like, God, help me to be the most loving person I can be today. Love is why, why I'm here, Lord. Or, Lord, show me your grace. Let me be aware of your grace in the world as I go about my day. And then secondly, that end-of-day kind of thinking and prayer, how we conclude our lives. And one of the things recommended by many, including Rory, is to make your gratitude list. What in what ways did grace or love impact your life? In what ways did someone affect you that maybe you didn't even interact with? What did you receive this day that gave you life? And be thankful. Gratitude is a way to abide. To remember not only how we continue to live life each day through what comes from beyond us, with nothing that we've done to earn it or deserve it, but also how we're able to interact with that and remember who we are deep inside. To be, to be loved and to love, it's that simple and it's that essential to enjoying the life we get to live. Let me conclude with two quotes from Mechtilde of Magdeburg, she was a church leader and a teacher in Germany during the 13th century. And what Mechtild helped Christians do, who were so caught up at that time in the institutional church, to remember that this relationship of love is at the core of who we are and why we're here. She says, a fish cannot drown in water, a bird does not fall in the air, each creature God made must live in its own true nature. How could I resist my nature that lives for oneness with God? If we know anything, we are created in God's image, and the nature of God is love. 
And therefore, what does that say about who we are at our core? There's one more quote here to share. The soul is made of love and must ever strive to return to love. Therefore, it can never find rest nor happiness in other things. It must lose itself in love. By its very nature, it must seek God, who is love. We seek our source. We find our purpose in the vine grower who's tending to the vine, of whom, Jesus, we are the branches. Jesus is the vine in God's vineyard. And we are the branches. May we remember that our very soul is made of love for the purpose of embodying and producing love as we find our rest and our joy in the ways that we abide. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's say what we believe together by using the Apostles' Creed. Together we profess. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. It's that time in our worship service where we normally receive an offering, and as we gather here in the room and together online. I simply want to say thank you for your generosity that continues to sustain the ministry of First Lutheran Church, both how we minister to one another within our membership and within this building and for the sake of our membership, but also beyond these walls and our membership as we reach out to our neighbors in need. Just a word to be aware of, on May 23rd, we will be collecting food for the YWCA family shelter that helps house families uh, in transition. And we'll be collecting food that they serve to the families. And so this Thursday's E! News will have a list of what we'll be collecting May 23rd. So be on the lookout for that. And again, thank you for being God's generous people, sustaining lives with your love.
Let us pray. Alive in the risen Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers before God who promises to hear us and answer in steadfast love. O God, whose very nature is love, help us to remember that we are created in your image. Remind us daily that we are born from love in order to embody love. A love that brings hope and healing to your world. Lord, help us as we strive to call that love our home. As we seek ways and make time to abide in you. Lord of new life, lead us in your love. Almighty God, we pray that in times of division and misunderstanding, we will be known as a people by how, how well we love one another. Give us patience and give us a yearning for understanding as we work to move toward the possibilities of cooperation, harmony, and unity. Help us as we do that through listening deeply and through gratitude for the sheer diversity and differences of your creation including the one beautiful human family. Lord of new life, lead yes. us in your love. As we slowly and intentionally move into life with a pandemic and begin to hope and dream of a world and our lives beyond a pandemic, please guide us as we continue to do whatever we can to be wise, to be good stewards of our gifts and of each other's lives, and to keep those who are most vulnerable safe. And as our ideas about returning to a more active and social life differ, help us to be patient with one another and to offer each other the grace and respect with which you regard us. We continue to pray for those areas of the world that are reeling with surges in positive coronavirus cases, even as we feel some sense of relief that perhaps, just perhaps, the worst is behind us here in this nation. Lord of new life, lead us in your love. We lift up to you, O God, those we wish to pray for this day, thankful for the lives of loved ones who have recently died, including Grace and Ralph, as we continue to hold their families in prayer, as you offer them comfort, and as you assure them, and we help do so, assure them that your promises and your love are stronger than death. We continue to pray for others whose needs are known to us and who have asked for our prayers. And so we lift up in prayer now Terry and Mark, Jane and Ron, Elijah, Emily, Sam, Helen, Deanna, Levi, Liam, Danielle, Chris, Dot, Eloise, Tim, Elizabeth, Mary Beth, Donald, Charlene, Melissa, B. Rachel, Howard, and Christine. There are others, O oh God, on our hearts and minds this day, others we wish to pray for. We take a moment now to name them before you, either silently or out loud. May we continue to be vessels of your compassion, your healing, and your ever-present comfort. Lord of new life, Lead us in your love. In the hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. I invite you to prepare for communion. Get your bread and wine or juice ready so that you may participate with us here in the room. And join with me as we prepare. The Lord is with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. 
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. on the night he was betrayed, took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body that is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup and gave thanks. He shared it with all of them, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's life, death, and resurrection as the foundation of our lives. Together we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We take a moment to receive communion. We remove our masks just for a moment so that we can receive. And we hear these words of promise. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and with mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
And now go with, go for, and go as the risen Christ to share new life with God's world. Thanks Thanks be to God. God.